hey, hey, do I have a treat for you today? You are looking at one of the ginormous water-cooled steel plates that will go under the orbital launch mount. And wowza, that thing is huge. It's about 9 to 10 meters across, but it's not as thick as I thought. It's only 14 to 16 inches, and the top plate is 2 to 2 and a half inches thick. This is some crazy engineering, folks. Those holes on the front are 8 inches each. They'll need some big machines and cranes to slide it through a leg sideways. Can't wait to see it in action. Shout out to Starship Gazer for these awesome picks. Meanwhile, the launch site has been making a multitude of remarkable progress recently. SpaceX has poured more than a thousand cubic meters of concrete under its orbital launch mount at its Starbase facility in Texas. The concrete pour, which took place over the course of several days, required about 113 trucks to transport the material to the site. The main area that still needs to be poured is not near the deluge pipework, and SpaceX expects to complete this work within the next two weeks. Once the concrete is partially cured, steel plates will be installed to provide additional support for the OLM. However, the concrete must fully cure before before any booster static fires can take place. Curing thick concrete like this typically involves spraying water on the surface to prevent cracking. While the installation of the steel plates does not directly improve the curing process, it's important to carefully manage moisture levels during this time. The concrete pour at the base of the OLM is a highly technical procedure that requires careful planning and execution. SpaceX has taken all necessary steps to ensure the concrete cures properly and that the OLM is ready for booster static fires as soon as possible. In other news, SpaceX has recently reinstated the cryogenic flex hoses on the booster quick disconnect atop the OLM. A cover is also being placed on the pipes to protect the plumbing. This work suggests that SpaceX is preparing to physically attach a hot stage to the current booster. This would require relocating the Starship Quick Disconnect on the tower to accommodate the increased height. This is likely the reason the ship QD umbilical was removed last month. SpaceX has not yet announced a date for the next static fire test of its orbital launch mount, but the company is making steady progress towards its goal of launching launching Starship into orbit later this year. While all that took place, SpaceX installed the 8th storage tank for the methane section of the orbital tank farm. SpaceX is replacing its old vertical tanks with new horizontal tanks that look like giant hot dogs. The new tanks are better protected from launch pad debris and they can store more propellant. The old vertical tanks were prone to damage from launch pad debris. If a piece of debris hit a vertical tank, it could rupture the tank and cause a major accident. The new horizontal tanks are much lower to the ground, so they are less likely to be hit by debris. The new horizontal tanks can also store more propellant. The old vertical tanks could only store about a thousand tons of propellant, but the new horizontal tanks can store up to 2,000 tons. This means that SpaceX can launch more starships with the new tanks. Of course, the new tanks are not perfect. They are still very large and expensive, and they still only hold enough propellant for a single orbital starship launch. So, SpaceX will need to build more tanks if it wants to launch multiple starships in a row. But the new tanks are a big step forward for SpaceX. They are safer, more efficient, and they can store more propellant. This means that SpaceX is one step closer to sending Starship to orbit and beyond. While both the OLM and tank farm repairs are underway, work has also been done on some future ships and boosters at the production site. SpaceX has just rolled out Booster 14's aft to the ring yard. That's Booster 14 as in the 14th one. They're building these things so fast that we may soon be at a point where we can just say another booster section without even bothering to give it a number. And it's not just the boosters. SpaceX is also building starships at an incredible rate. The new production buildings are almost complete, and once they're up and running, SpaceX's production rate is going to be even more insane. As of this recording, Mega Bay 3 Section 3 on Level 3 is currently being lifted into place. This is just one of many new production buildings that SpaceX is building. When they're all finished, SpaceX will be able to crank out starships at an unprecedented rate. So why does SpaceX need so many prototypes? Well, they're not just building starships for the fun of it, they're building them so they can send humans to Mars. And the only way to do that is to build a lot of starships and test them as much as possible. The more starships SpaceX builds, the more data they'll collect, and
and the more data they collect, the better they'll be able to design and build the next generation of starships. And SpaceX is not just racing against time to get to Mars, they are racing against others as well. Four brave volunteers just entered a simulated Mars habitat for a year-long mission. They're not trained astronauts, but they're about to face some real challenges. The volunteers are research scientist Kelly Haston. She's responsible for keeping the crew healthy and happy. But with limited resources and no way to call for help, she'll have to be creative. Like when she used her expertise in plants to grow a crop of potatoes in the habitat's small kitchen garden. Next, we have structural engineer Ross Brockwell. He's in charge of keeping the habitat habitat running smoothly, but when things start to break down, he'll need to think on his feet. Like when he used his engineering skills to fix a broken water pump using only a wrench and some duct tape. Good old duct tape. Next up is emergency medicine physician Nathan Jones. He's the crew's doctor, but he'll also need to help out with other tasks. Like when he used his medical skills to stitch up a crewmate's cut after a clumsy accident. And finally, we have U.S. Navy microbiologist Anka Salariu. She's studying how to grow food food in Martian soil, but she'll also need to help out with other chores like cleaning the bathrooms. Like when she used her microbiology skills to help break down the crew's waste into fertilizer for the potato crop. The crew will face all sorts of challenges during this year-long mission. They'll have to deal with limited resources, equipment failure, communication delays, and environmental stressors. But if they can survive, they'll be one step closer to sending the first astronauts to Mars. Here are some of the challenges they'll encounter. Limited resources. The habitat is only 1,700 square feet, which is smaller than the average U.S. single-family home. This means the crew will have to share everything, from the bathroom to the kitchen. They'll also have to be careful not to waste any resources as they won't be able to resupply. Equipment failure. Things will break down on a Mars mission just like they do here on Earth. The crew will need to be able to fix things themselves or they'll be in big trouble. Communication delays. It takes about 13 minutes for a signal to travel between Earth and Mars. This means that if the crew needs help, they won't be able to get it right away. They'll need to be able to solve their own problems. And lastly, environmental stressors. The Martian environment is harsh and unforgiving. The crew will have to deal with extreme temperatures, low gravity, and a lack of oxygen. They'll also need to be careful not to breathe in the Martian dust, which is known to be toxic. But if they can survive these challenges, they'll be one step closer to sending the first astronauts to Mars. The crew's year-long mission is the first of three planned Mars surface simulations. Each mission will last one year, and the information collected and studied over the course of these missions will help NASA send the first astronauts to Mars in the future. These volunteers are not only brave, but determined. They're not astronauts, but they're about to embark on one of the most important missions in human history. In our last bit of today's news, Sierra Space is preparing for the first flight of its Dream Chaser vehicle, all while outlining long-term ambitions for both that vehicle and space station modules. The company is currently in the final stages of integration and testing at its Colorado factory. The spacecraft is then scheduled to ship to NASA's Neil Armstrong Test Facility in Ohio for thermal vacuum testing. After that, it'll head out to the Kennedy Space Center for final launch preparations. Tom Weiss, Sierra Space's CEO, said he expects Dream Chaser to be fully integrated with its launch vehicle, United Launch Alliance's Vulcan Centaur, in the December timeframe, and launch in a window that extends into early February. However, the timing is dependent on the readiness of the Vulcan rocket. ULA announced on June 24th that it needed to make a minor reinforcement to part of the Centaur upper stage, delaying its first launch for an unspecified period. The first Dream Chaser will launch on the second Vulcan after the inaugural launch that carries payloads for Astrobotic, Amazon, and Celestis. The launch is the first of at least seven Sierra Space will perform for NASA to transport cargo to and from the International Space Station. The company the company is also working on a second version of Dream Chaser that will carry both crew and cargo. Vice said that the version will have 40% greater cargo capacity than the first version and can support a six-person crew. Here are some of the challenges Sierra Space will have to overcome in launching Dream Chaser. The readiness of the Vulcan rocket. Again, the company will need to wait until ULA completes a reinforcement work before it can launch Dream Chaser. The weather. 
Launches are often delayed or cancelled due to bad weather. Sierra Space will need to keep an eye on the weather forecast and make sure that it's safe to launch Dream Chaser before it does so. Lastly, technical problems. Any number of technical problems could arise during the launch of Dream Chaser. Sierra Space will need to be prepared to deal with any problems that may occur. Despite these challenges, Sierra Space is confident that it will be able to launch Dream Chaser in December. The company has a lot of experience in launching spacecraft and it has a team of talented engineers and technicians who are are dedicated to making Dream Chaser a success. Well folks, that wraps up our show for today. We hope you enjoyed learning more about the amazing progress over at SpaceX, the groundbreaking NASA Mars simulation mission, and the progress of Sierra Space's Dream Chaser. If you want to support our channel and get access to exclusive content, please consider becoming a patron by clicking the link in the description below. We appreciate your generosity and your passion for space exploration. As always, this is Kevin from Great SpaceX, and until next time, keep looking up.